Hello, everyone. Welcome to Survivorship Optimizing Your Wellness Multiple Myeloma. I'm Kelly Craft, Program Manager at Gildas Club Quad Cities. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give a little bit of information about what Gildas Club Quad Cities does. We are a cancer support community and we provide 100% free uh, social and emotional support to anyone impacted by cancer. So that means a person with an active diagnosis, survivors, friends and family, kids and teens. And we do that support with programs like support groups, educational workshops, healthy lifestyle activities like yoga, social events, and we're also a hub for resources and referrals. You can get started with us by calling 563-326-7504 or on our website at guildsofqc.org. Um, if you're watching this on Facebook, feel free to comment in any questions and we'll get them answered live. Um, and then without further ado, we're happy to be live with Kim Gibbs and I'll let her take it away. Hi, good, e good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I am going to share my screen, hopefully anyway, with technology you just never know. So we're going to we're going to just go for it here. Um, and you can let me know. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you very much for attending this evening's program on cancer survivorship and optimizing your wellness. Um, this is such an important topic um, that it deserves a lot of thought. And so I want to give you some, I'm going to have, I'm going to share some questions with you, um, some little polling questions. So if somebody wants to put the, wants to come off mute, maybe, and help me out and answer some questions, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, you can try, you can put them in chat. I'll try and pay attention to it um, so that I can get some feedback. Um, but first of all, let me give you just a little bit of background about me, and let me see if I can advance my slide here. Again, my name is Kim Gibbs. Uh, my background is as a myeloma stem cell transplant coordinator. I did that for 17 years at Seidman Cancer Center in St. Louis at Washington University Medical Center. And then I transitioned to Takeda, um, which was Millennium, but Takeda Pharmaceuticals as a clinical nurse educator. And I have done that for the last seven years. I had the opportunity to pioneer a new role as a patient advocacy liaison for which we are a very new role. We are just, just have passed our one year birth date. So we're, we've quit crawling now, we're walking and soon we'll be running, but um, just wanted to give you a little background there so that you know, most of my oncology nursing career has been in myeloma, um, although I did start my very, the very beginning of my nursing career as a transplant nurse on the floor treating all types of heme uh, oncology. So without further ado, let's address a, just a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll jump right into it. So first, you know, because we're live and we're virtual, um, let's remain on mute during the presentation again, unless you feel comfortable coming off mute to answer a poll question. Um, otherwise, we will have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, whether it's off mute or in the chat. Again, um, really important for us to just understand that everything we discussed tonight is for education purposes only. And it's not to be considered as medical advice because your best resource as a patient as a survivor with cancer or um, a cancer diagnosis or a myeloma diagnosis um, is your best resource is your healthcare team. Um, they know your particular disease, they know your particular journey. So please, you know, if it's a personal question regarding your own treatment, um, I cannot address that because I'm not your nurse. So take those questions, keep a piece of paper handy, um, and write those questions down to take them back to your healthcare team because, again, they are your best resource. So, our overview for our presentation tonight is what is wellness and survivorship, and why are they important? Uh, what are some of the physical, psychological, and social challenges presented by a cancer diagnosis and its treatments? And how can people living with cancer plan and handle these challenges? So I want you to think about maybe not so much uh, the realm of survivorship. I like to look at it as thrivership because thriving with quality of life with a cancer diagnosis is so important. And that is why 
we have this robust um, body of work done on survivorship and how we can really thrive and really move forward with quality of life on whatever journey it is that you're currently on, even as a caregiver um, with a loved one that may have a cancer diagnosis. So we're going to start by defining wellness and survivorship. And so I want to ask, how would you define wellness? So I'll give it a couple of seconds here if somebody's willing to come off mute and share how they define wellness. Um, that would be great. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's okay too. I can, I can help with that because that's what we're here for tonight, right? Is to learn. So we'll just move past this and we'll give you some definitions, something to think about. So what is wellness? So according to the National Wellness Institute, wellness is an active process through which people become aware of and make choices toward a more successful existence. So essentially wellness is involves us striving for a healthier, healthier habits in all aspects of our life. And we wanna have um, overall health. Uh, so the World Health Organization actually notes that wellness is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So I wanna draw your attention to the six dimensions of wellness, because again, I think survivorship, the term survivorship can sometimes have a negative connotation to it. It's like you're just barely getting by, you're just surviving. When really in the world and the, the statistics that we're gonna talk about tonight a little bit, you'll see that not only are you not alone, but there are many, many millions of folks out there living with a cancer diagnosis or having a care partner. So we're going to look at these. Uh, we're going to talk about these dimensions of wellness, and we're going to talk a little bit about each one of them throughout the remainder of the program. So whether it's occupational, physical, emotional, intellectual, social or spiritual, we're going to talk a little bit about each of them. So who is a cancer survivor? That's an important question. A cancer survivor is anybody that denotes themselves as a cancer survivor. From the moment of diagnosis, you are considered a cancer survivor. And I would even expand that to include the care partners, the care partners, the families, you are all cancer survivors or thrivers. And your goal is to live through and live beyond that cancer diagnosis. And acknowledging that life post a cancer diagnosis is different. I mean, you have different outlooks on life. You have may, it may change and produce what we call the new normal. So we're gonna answer, what is cancer survivorship? Well, much like wellness, survivorship uh, touches on all aspects of your life, physical symptoms, health-related quality of life, disease progression for those of you that may have a myeloma diagnosis um, or perhaps um, um, any other type of like a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis. We're always waiting for kind of that proverbial next shoe to drop. When is the disease going to progress? When am I going to have a recurrence? So these are all things that you are dealing with, you and your loved ones are dealing with on a daily basis, which shifts how we see the world. So we need to understand that a part of cancer care or survivorship care really does involve helping patients with the effects of cancer, its treatments, and to achieve wellness and establish that new normal that I mentioned. So the Cancer Wellness Coalition has defined three stages of cancer survivorship. And I want you to just think about these, not necessarily as individual items, but kind of a, a journey. So we have the acute survivorship, or that's when you've just been diagnosed. 
And that kind of goes through that part of that portion of the journey that includes your treatment, your initial treatments, um, whether that is some type of surgery, some type of radiation, some type of chemotherapy, or perhaps even uh, for a myeloma patient, it would be an induction therapy combined with stem cell transplant perhaps, or just establishing a treatment regimen with your healthcare team. And then we roll down that journey or down that road to quality of life with extended survivorship. And that starts at the end of your initial treatment. So for, again, using the example of a myeloma patient, once they've moved into a maintenance therapy, something that they will be on for lifelong and continually. And, the, and we're looking there again at the effects of cancer and its treatments. Those are our focuses. What, what and how do we have to manage perhaps the side effects of treatments. Um, very important to extend, again, extend your thrivership. And then we have permanent survivorship, or again, at thrivership, I prefer thrivership, it has a happier connotation, um, is when years have passed, perhaps, since your cancer diagnosis and your cancer treatment, and there's less chance of your cancer coming back now for a myeloma patient. Unfortunately, um, it is still considered a non-curable cancer. So therefore, permanent survivorship takes on a different, a little bit of a different feel and taste. So while for some patients, they may never have a recurrence, um, for others, we have to look down there, down the line, down their road, down their journey. And we have to address some of the long-term effects of cancer and treatment. And that's our focus. It's managing some of the things that maybe we don't think about when we're in that acute and extended survivorship stages. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those are and what they look like, uh, because these things are some things that maybe we don't think about in the long term when we're talking about our overall survivorship. So I would say that the tone, so to speak, of this presentation is more about an umbrella of thrivership and wellness and quality of life. And looking at some of the things, as I said, maybe we don't think about that may affect us down our road or down our journey. So why is this important? It's important because survivorship is a growing concern. And that's because we know that because of early diagnosis and the evolving treatment landscape, that these have led to an increase of the number of cancer survivors. As you can see here, the five-year survival rate has grown from 49% in 1975 to 71% in 2019 and is projected to be even higher the further out we go. And as of January 2019, 16.9 million, remember I mentioned you're not alone, 16.9 million of Americans, now, now that's just Americans, that's just the United States statistics, were cancer survivors. And as you can see on the right, the estimated number of cancer survivors in the United States by 2030 is anticipated to be 22.2 million of people that have walked the walk and talked the talk on this thrivership journey. And that number is even estimated to go even higher when we're talking about cancer prevalence and the projections. So this is really referred to as the silver tsunami. And it's those are very big words, but it's because of the baby boomer generation. I'm part of the baby boomer, boomer generation. And because we are living longer, as just mentioned on that previous slide, we're living longer because of, you know, the evolving understanding of cancer and its treatments. So we are an older aging population. And so we're coming to that older, let's say more mature age that we're bringing with that our history of having been exposed to or been through a cancer diagnosis and its treatments. So therefore we have a unique set of healthcare needs that will need to be addressed. 
Now, before we get into this big slide that looks like a lot of things on it, um, I think it's really important to understand the history. But I want to check in because we've kind of moved pretty fast through the first 15 slides. So I want to check in and see if everybody is OK and we're good to move forward. And you can just write it in the in the chat, say, OK, um, we're good to go. And if I don't hear anything, I'll assume we're all good to go. <laughs> I know it's hard sometimes to, to monitor and run through the presentation too. So it's, un, it's important to understand the history because we always need to understand where we've been before we can understand where we're going. So uh, survivorship is not a new idea. It has been around, as you can see here, since 1986 when the National Coalition of Cancer Survivors or the NCCS founded um, the coalition in, under, in an attempt to understand and address the needs of patients with cancer and their care partner issues. So in 1990, the founding chair, Barbara Hoffman, testified before Congress. I mean, this, is, this has been moving forward for many years, testifying before Congress on how to include cancer survivors in the protection of the American with Disabilities Act. That's a big deal. We need to have make sure that we're accounting for this particular patient population. So we have to understand how this is moving down, um, for instance, in, in Congress and the, the laws that have been made and how we need to include this particular community. 1996 was the first publication um, looking at cancer care and patient from a patient's perspective. So if you really want to know what it's like to be a cancer patient, maybe you should ask, ask a cancer patient, right? And get the real skinny on that. To 2010, the first ever patient-centered commission of cancer accreditation standards. Now, these are developments and plans and requirements that are put upon institutions in order to have a qualified survivorship program. Now, whether that's providing um, the ability for, a, a, for instance, a nurse practitioner to set up appointments that are strictly for survivorship, or it's to include a survivorship plan, so to speak, in your electronic medical records. So these are all steps to make this survivorship plan easier to navigate. And then again, in 2014, they developed a program about important policy issues that they're taking to the Hill so that they can get quality of care and understand that this particular community has a set of pre-existing health care issues that need to be included in the Affordable Care Act. All very important, um, very important acts along the way to really set up survivorship and thrivership as um, as a global um, a global community of activists. And so that's kind of the history as we move forward. As I said, it's always good to understand where we've been before we can understand and kind of get the uh, importance of where we move forward. So what is that impact of cancer and its treatments? What is the impact to you? We just talked about some of the impact that it can have on the cancer community, on the globe, on the policies that are taken to um, Congress to be written into law. So let's talk a little bit more centrically, more patient-centric, about the impact of cancer and its treatments. So what aspects of your life has cancer impacted? That's a super important question because I bet if I had some answers in the chat, I would see that many of you would say, well, every aspect of my life, it has touched every aspect of my life. So, and that is, that is, a very good and very quality, qualitative answer because it really does impact every aspect of your life. Remember those first couple of slides that we saw with the wellness community and then um, 
what a survivorship plan should look like and include and what and how that affects your life. So as we said, it, it impacts every aspect of your life. And if you look here on this kind of busy slide, but remember we're talking about person centric now. So cancer thriver, cancer survivor in the center as you, the patient, your caregiver, your care partners, your family, your friends, this can impact every aspect of your life. And we're going to talk about a little bit of each one of these aspects in order for us to get a kind of a full picture, a full, um, a full puzzle picture of, we're gonna put all these pieces together to get that full picture of what thrivership and quality of life on this cancer journey looks like. For instance, physical well-being, we're going to look at strength or fatigue and pain, very important aspect of cancer diagnosis, its treatments and its uh, journey throughout life. Physical well-being, anxiety, depression, fear of reoccurrence, all very real aspects of a patient living with cancer, with a cancer diagnosis, whether it's an active diagnosis or if it's one that is considered to be um, in remission or even cured. And then social well-being. What is how does cancer a cancer diagnose, diagnosis impact my social well-being, my social life, my family, my finances, my work? And then finally, spiritually, how does it interact with us spiritually. Um, many people have a, a question when, some, when they get a diagnosis of cancer. It's a, a why me or what have I done? Um, what is the meaning? They want to understand the meaning behind the journey that has been now given to them. So we'll take a little peek at that too and talk about some of those aspects. But first, I want to touch on physical well-being. That was our first box there up on the top left. And cancer, as you can see, cancer affects every part of your body, requiring continuous monitoring and treatment. I used to tell my patients all the time, um, who were myeloma patients, that unfortunately, myeloma was a, a cancer that could affect them from the top of their head to the tips of their toes and everywhere in between. And I think that applies kind of pan cancer diagnosis because of treatments, because of the disease itself, because of the side effects of the disease. And how do we manage those? We have to be prepared to do so. And some types of cancer, such as myeloma, are becoming more and more considered a chronic disease. So how do we manage those things chronically, somewhat like you would um, heart disease or uh, high blood pressure or diabetes. These are all diseases that we manage chronically for long periods of time. So how do we finally, how do we manage those side effects that can occur during treatment and may have long-term and late-term effects? And we're going to define long-term and late-term effects for you so that you have a better understanding what your healthcare team is looking at when they're looking and um, um, hopefully looking down the road to make sure that they're going to catch these things or they're aware. So as I mentioned, physical effects can be late or long-term. And a study that was done found that 25% of cancer survivors reported poor physical health and more than 10% of them reported poor mental health. And I would, I would venture to say that that 10% number could be even higher because of the long-term nature and the chronic nature of a cancer diagnosis. So I wanna define for you quickly long-term effects and late-term effects because they can be different while they can cross over. So there's not definitely a column for long-term effects and a column for late effects. They can cross over, but some are just more common at different times on your journey. So long-term effects develop during treatment and can persist after completion of treatment. And that can be things that you've heard of, I'm sure. 
chemo brain, right? Everybody has heard about how the effects of chemotherapy can sometimes make you a little foggy and you feel not quite as sharp as you were prior to that therapy. Um, it can cause hormone issues. It can cause incontinence issues, sexual dysfunction, which we'll look at a little bit further in the presentation, and lymphedema. And then we have late effects. Late effects develop or become apparent months or years after treatment is completed. And these are things that we need to look at because we're planning that quality of life on our journey. So we need to be aware as the patient, as the care partner, as the healthcare team about the possibility that these may um, come about post your transplant or post your treatment many years down the line, such things as bone loss, um, thyroid issues, hearing loss, cardiac problems or heart problems. Um, and for instance, and as we mentioned earlier, and I you know, said, I think that 10% reported on poor mental health is low, post-traumatic stress, always that fear that this disease is going to come back or reoccur, or when does that happen? So these are things that we need to consider when we're looking at a long-term plan. Now, as I said, this is this whole presentation is much uh, a lot about a umbrella plan, things we need to look at, not necessarily written down, not a book that says survivorship or thrivership plan, but things we need to really keep in mind and look for throughout your journey. And we're continuing with those physical challenges with pain and fatigue. These are the two most common complaints that healthcare providers such as myself heard from our patients, but they, sh they are not hand in hand with a cancer diagnosis. So always have great communication with your healthcare team when you're dealing with these two things, because they can be caused by different things. Are you in pain? Many causes of pain can be treated and it's not just handing out medications. It can be a, a number of um, things, including counseling and including um, meditation and uh, medications obviously can be somewhat mixed and matched. Um, it doesn't just have to be what we hear nowadays, the opioids that control pain. Uh, fatigue. Fatigue um, can be a can be caused by a number of other things. Maybe you have low, low blood counts because you're on constant treatment. Um, maybe it's nutritional related. Perhaps it's depression and anxiety related. And very, very important to tell your healthcare team about these underlying issues because they can be and should be dealt with to improve quality of life. So now we're going to switch to that next box on our on our slide a couple of slides ago, your physical well being. So people with a cancer diagnosis obviously experience psychological challenges, anxiety, depression, uh, distress, and it's actually said that a patient that lives the data supports that a patient that lives longer with a cancer diagnosis has is it at increased risk to suffer from depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress syndrome. So always, most institutions, most physicians that are dealing with oncology patients can either refer you to a counselor or they have one on their oncology team. So always take these concerns back to your healthcare team for assistance. And now we're moving on more into our social aspects of our life, our sexual um, lives as human beings. Um, sexuality and intimacy is what makes us human social beings. So in addition to those physical changes that can impact your sex life and your, your relationship with your partner, cancer treatments can also alter relationships between you and your friends. Intimacy is not just with your partner. Intimacy can include your friends, it can include your family members. So always be open and honest and have these discussions. Talk to your healthcare team about your sexuality, about your intimacy challenges, because there are counselors that can address these issues. And always 
talk to them in a manner that you feel comfortable. Um, discussing your sexuality with your partner can be a very touchy, so to speak, subject um, and often difficult to talk about. But one of the most often mentioned side effect management issues that patients have, ask for those referrals, get reacquainted with uh, and set aside time to discuss these things with your partner. Um, consider a couple's relationship that can shed light on what may be going on from both perspectives, patient and care partner. Um, and sometimes if those things make you uncomfortable, write them down and share them with your, your partner that way or share them with your healthcare team in that manner. However you're comfortable, that can address these issues. Because again, as I said, sexuality and intimacy are part of us as human beings and social beings. And speaking of social beings, what are navigating changes in our social interactions? What does that look like? You know, we've moved, um, we've talked about being open and honest and having those honest conversations, but this is where you get to take back a little bit of control. Um, you need to give yourself time to adjust. I always said, give yourself some grace. Um, this is a major life-changing diagnosis. Give yourself some grace. Plan what you want to say. Plan how much you want to share, what you feel comfortable with, with your um, social circle. Open and honest. Always be open and honest about negative and positive feelings with your loved ones so that they can really understand where you're coming from and where you're at. Um, let others know what to expect as you heal. Um, you know, we used to tell our, our transplant patients all the time, yes, you've been out of transplant for three months and you're telling me that you're super fatigued, but your family doesn't understand. So have those conversations. Um, get advice from the, your healthcare team on how to approach those subjects and explain them uh, to your satisfaction. Stay in contact with family and friends. Accept help but set boundaries because that's okay. Setting boundaries about what you feel comfortable sharing is your prerogative. It's a piece of a way for you to take back control when you had no control about your diagnosis, but you have things in your life that you can take back control. And then do the things that you're doing here by educating yourself, by joining a support group like Gilda's Club, um, all of those things can help navigate those social interactions and social challenges that may come along on your journey. And it wouldn't be a fair survivorship or thrivership presentation without addressing our ever so important, important care partners. What is the impact to them? Because care partners have their own needs. They have to address their needs in order to provide for you as a healthy, well-balanced care partner. And what, some are, what are some of the obstacles that they may face? Well, they may face some of the same things that you're facing as a patient. So again, having those open conversations about, you know, your care partner's not sleeping. They're having physical aches and pains. They're not eating either. So discuss those things. Maybe they're depressed. They're dealing with a loved one that has had a, a devastating diagnosis. And how are we going to move forward from that as a team? Um, how is it going to affect us financially? Most people, most families, couples, care partners, tribes, for, any, for a lack of a better uh, term, are, are a two-income family. And so now we have one partner that needs to be um, somewhat out of the workforce for a while to receive treatments. And we have the care partner that is taking on that financial burden, plus needing to get their help, their partner to those treatments and needing to take time off of work. So always thinking about our care partners because they can't be good for you if they're not good for themselves. So taking time out as the care partner for some self-care. Self-care isn't selfish, as it says here. 
Don't be afraid to ask others for help. People want to help your family, your friends, your social interactions, your uh, perhaps even your employees or your employer want to help. Set small but specific goals around your self-care. Say, I'm going to give myself a 10-minute walk. I just need to get outside or even like myself during the winter, it's on a treadmill. Um, watching some silly program that makes no sense whatsoever, but just giving yourself that minute prioritize your sleep and nutrition. You can join a support group as well. There are support groups that are out there that are strictly um, for care partners. So consider that. And always finally, identify and acknowledge your feelings and be communicative about those feelings and share them with your partner so that everybody's on the same page, so to speak. This is a big one, right? And I think this the picture says a, a picture is worth a thousand wor words and here on the left you can see this person this this individual here that is bearing this huge load about how finances and the long-term effects the long journey for patients with a cancer diagnosis can affect your overall financial well-being there are financial counselors. I encourage everyone to um, talk to the social, the social worker that is on your healthcare team. They can direct you to um, ways to be assisted either with medications or copay assistance. Um, I'll take this minute to put in a, a plug for going to the pharmaceutical companies. They have assistance programs. Don't leave that money on the table. Your social worker at your institution can help you and assist you with managing those things. So use the, those resources in order to help you um, with out-of-pocket expenses, with, um, uh, with filling your prescriptions, and always take care to, to address these items because this will help decrease this huge burden and the huge weight that you have on your shoulders. And that huge weight can also be helped with a spiritual being of, uh, of belief in a force or a power beyond yourself, whatever that may be, whether it's a church community, whether it's meditation, whether it's um, just a commu the community of your support group, whatever makes you feel connected and enriches your life. Even if it's just taking, you know, a half an hour to do some yoga and some meditation, but some people become more spiritual during their journey and some find other ways to express themselves and maybe of that church community I mentioned. But in one survey, 8% of respondents said that they experienced emotional concerns. Cancer, cancer diagnosis, as we have established throughout this presentation, is a full on change of your entire life. It impacts everything in your life. So take those concerns, discuss them, discuss them with your, your church community, your care partners, your family, just so that everyone knows um, what you're thinking or what you're feeling. And if you are one of those people that likes to keep those things private, then share that privacy within and um, raise your own spirituality however you see fit. Because survivors can adapt to a new normal. If we're on this long journey, we kind of don't have a choice. We want that thrivership. We want to move through and beyond that cancer diagnosis. So what does some of that new normal look like? Well, it's being open to emotions, both positive and negative, as I mentioned earlier. It's identifying what you can and cannot control. I also mentioned that you can't control your cancer diagnosis. You can't control how you perceive your journey, your thrivership, your survivorship. Learn how to cope with stress. We know that stress equals unhealthy um, things. So we always want to be able to deal with stress. Um, establish that ongoing care plan with your healthcare providers. They can be your best resource for putting together your plan. 
learn relaxation techniques. I think we could all learn some relax and relaxation techniques over the last two years with dealing with the pandemic. So some of these can really assist you in identifying your goals for what you want your quality of life and your thrivership to look like. And when you're creating that ongoing plan, what does it look like? How do we do that? Well, we've talked about, you know, all of the impacts of the different portions or boxes, so to speak, of our lives and um, how they all affect us as the patient in the middle or the care partner or the family. But how do we go about actually doing this? So the importance of it is because it is an ongoing plan. This is meant to be a flexible living document, however you choose to move forward with your survivorship or thrivership plan. It's sometimes re referred to as a survivorship plan. Others call just refer to it as their kind of maintenance plan. What do I need to do to maintain my quality of life? Um, your plan is your roadmap. It's a roadmap of your journey. It's It should include um, your treatments. It should include your staging and diagnosis. It should include any of the important testing that you've had throughout your journey. And you build this. You have you take ownership and you build your plan and then you share it with your healthcare team because they can be, as I mentioned, that great resource that can fill in the blanks. You can ask them, you know, take a look at this. Am I missing something when it comes to my treatments or um, my my staging at diagnosis or my plan? So they can be really informative and really helpful on this roadmap because there are essential components of a survivorship care plan. We have to understand prevention, surveillance, intervention, and coordination. So what are all those four pieces of this pie? How do they come together to make it a really good rich pie that is covering everything? Well, we have to look at reoccurrence or new cancers and those late effects I mentioned, cardiac issues, hearing loss, those kinds of things. Reoccurrence or second cancers, secondary cancers, um, and assessing your psychological well being and your psychosocial well being. And then we have treating the consequences of the cancer and its treatments. Remember, managing those side effects. Um, if you're a myeloma patient that is on long term continuous therapy, in order to keep that disease at bay, we have to manage those side effects. And then coordination, know who your team is, know the social worker, know the nurse navigator, know the nurse practitioner, know the nurses, shameless plug for nurses, um, and coordinate, especially between your PCPs. Sometimes they get left out once there's been a diagnosis of um, some type of cancer and you're moving to the care of an oncologist, that PCP doesn't always get clued in on what's been going on. So always incumbent upon you as the survivor or thriver to pull them in the loop. And you can do that by sharing your ongoing plan. Um, your cancer specialist can collect information about your diagnosis. You can keep these in a binder, in a journal, on a digital file, however it works best for you and is the easiest to manage. You're going to want to define your goals for your quality of life. You're going to search for resources that meet those goals, whether it's a discussion with a financial advisor or uh, appointments with a psychologist or a group or marital counseling or partnership counseling. And you're going to review these plans with your healthcare team on an ongoing basis so that everybody knows the right hand knows what the left hand is doing and you have it documented so that you can provide that information quickly, easily, and succinctly. So there is a community of uh, providers that are playing a role in your care. Your healthcare team, the immediate oncology healthcare team, they play a key role in educating and supporting people. Communication, communication, communication. I'm sure you've probably heard that a lot of times, but it is the key to creating your goals, to supporting you through your journey. You must communicate. Primary healthcare provider, 
often serves as your main provider. He's the guy you call when you have the flu or the cold, common cold. Make sure that he knows what kind of treatment you're on. He or she knows what kind of treatment you're on, what your treatment plan is. Again, my shameless plug for nurses and patient navigators. Um, we are there to help educate and guide you through the treatment process as well. And then social workers. They help guide you through the experience of living with cancer, and they can also provide you with, um, you know, referrals to um, to financial providers or get you in um, some kind of copay program or some type of program with the pharmaceutical companies in order to ease that burden for the medication. So always take advantage and know your healthcare team. So what's next? We've gone through all of these things. I've given lots of information about looking at survivorship or thrivership as an umbrella and as an ongoing flexible living document that has your goals about what you want for your quality of life. So what's your role? Well, your role is to work with your healthcare team to schedule regular health assessments, screenings and monitorings. I used to tell my patients all the time, Having a cancer diagnosis does not give you a get out of jail free card for your mammograms, your colonoscopies, your PCAs, your whatever your maintenance testing is, it does not give you a get out of jail free card for that. So keep that as part of your care plan is your maintenance care. So always um, addressing bone health and nutrition and dental health hearing and vision, all of those things should be taken care of as a maintenance schedule because we want to live a healthy lifestyle, which includes good nutrition, exercise, um, stress management, super important. Um, again, engage in regular activity. If you are a myeloma patient, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to discuss any type of um, and any type of exercise program that you'd like to partake because sometimes you can have bone issues. So please take that up with your healthcare team before you start it. Eat a healthy diet, whatever that is. Always discuss that with your healthcare team as well because many of the newer diets, for instance, keto or vegetarian, they can affect some of the lab results that your physician is seeing. So Make sure that you key them in because they may see something a little bit different. Achieve, maintain, and healthy weight. Get enough sleep. It's documented and data supports. We don't get enough sleep. Eight hours a night, we just don't get it. So if you can find a way to do that, certainly do that. Consider a nap. A nap is good. Give yourself the grace to take a nap. Knitting, walking. A meditation app, those are all things that can help reduce that stress level. And how do we manage that stress level? So we used to use this in my institution, a distress management tool. Are you feeling out of sorts? You can kind of figure out where you're at on this, on this temperature gauge by thinking about and conveying whether, where you are psychologically. Um, are you in your head about something in particular? And we give this and ask patients to rate themselves. And pretty much for the most part, if you're being honest, anybody that has an ongoing cancer diagnosis, doubtfully is going to be a zero. So don't worry about you know, thinking, oh, well, this isn't normal if I'm a three, because you can be a three. We just need to figure out why you might be a three or why you might be a six and what we can do to alleviate that stress. So this management tool can be found and is used in lots of institutions, but it can also be found online in some of the resources that I'll share at the end of the presentation. And then finally, we're getting close, folks. Questions you may consider asking your healthcare team regarding your survivorship. How, what kind of information do I need to be garnering from my healthcare team in order to have a well-rounded, flexible living document that encompasses everything that it's important for my quality of life. How often should I reevaluate my ongoing care plan? Well, every time you see your physician or something life, a life change, always keep it as a living document. What long-term health issues might I experience as a result of my cancer and its treatment? Remember those late-term effects and those long effects. 
Remember those because they're important to be addressed. What symptoms should I tell you about? All of them. You know your body best. If there's something that's telling you in that gut that you need to address something that this isn't quite right, always take that back to your healthcare team. Um, what records do I need to keep about my treatment? Well, I would say, as I said before, staging. Um, your Maybe if you have myeloma, you would keep your cytogenetic testing, um, your treatment regimens that you've had, and importantly, maybe some of the side effects that you've had with those treatments. And then obviously they can su suggest a support group. They may have suggested Gilda's Club. So please ask those questions. And here finally are some of the resources. Now I would um, I would encourage you if you have, which most people do nowadays, they have their little cell phone right next to them. Um, snap a shot. There's one of three slides here that have very well vetted, reliable resources for preparing your own survivorship care plan. Um, all of these don't go to Dr. Google. We, we never encourage Dr. Google. Um, so always go to some reliable resource. And I will share these last three slides and then we will move on to questions and answers. So if you want, you can take this again, as I said, take a quick picture. Um, or if anybody wants me to pull this back up when we're in the Q&A, that's fine. I can do that as well. And here's the last slide of that. Resource Navigator by Multiple My by the Concur Magazine is a wonderful resource. Family Reach, Live Strong at the YMCA. These are all things that can help improve your quality of life so that you can really thrive on your journey. And just a quick, quick couldn't get that out, a quick recap. Uh, navigating your survivorship journey can be complex. And I know I've shared a lot of information with you over the last 50 minutes. Um, and it is and can be very daunting, but you can do it. This is something you can take control of. Um, it's always evolving. It's always changing. It's always living. Discuss it with your healthcare team. They can help. Long-term and late-term effects, always wanting to know what those are, what um, they are in relation to the treatments that you've had so that you can understand, look out for, and uh, take care of if that impacts you at, in your quality of life. An ongoing care plan can help guide you in monitoring and maintaining your health. As I said, having a cancer diagnosis doesn't get you a get out of jail free card for your mammograms, your PSAs, and your colonoscopies. Sorry. Communicate with your healthcare team about all health changes. If you notice, listen to your gut. You know that. You know your body's best. And survivorship really does mean optimizing wellness, optimizing thriving in quality of life for your journey. So advocate for yourself. This is, as I said, where you get to take control back. Um, always be your own best advocate. And that's the whole meaning of this education is to just help you and guide you and give you some tangible things that you can look for in order to improve your overall quality of life on your journey. And with that, maybe you can put this in the chat. That would be the beginning of our Q&A session. What is one action you would take based on what you learned in this presentation? So I'll turn it back over and I'll stop sharing so that we can have some q and I can look at the chat and we can see what's going on. Thank you everybody for your attention. That was great. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, I'm looking on Facebook and it doesn't look like we have any questions on Facebook. So I'm going to end the live stream and we can just be with our Zoom participants. So anyone watching on Facebook, thank you so much and have a great night.